Good morning again. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. And let me begin by saying our heartfelt sympathies go out to the great nation of France, to the victims, those that are trying to recover from this terrible atrocity that occurred Friday night. And I'm sure events will continue to unfold even as we have this conversation, but I will ask that you silence your cell phones and you keep your attention to the front because we have an extraordinary panel to help us understand the implications of the largest population <coughs> movement to occur in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Before we invite our panelists up to begin our conversation, we thought it would be helpful, I always find it to be helpful, to have maps and to show you, in effect, what this migration crisis, the numbers that we're talking about and the routes that they are taking. These images that I'm about to show you come from the EU Frontex Agency. These are the most up-to-date statistics that we have. There may be others that are used, but we thought, and again, we also put those, uh, these slides uh, on your table. I wanted to begin with just giving you a sense of breadth and depth. After we just reviewed these slides very briefly, we have a speaker that's coming to us via pre-recorded video. Kelly Clements, the Deputy Commissioner of the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, a video taped a message for our panel discussion. This message, of course, was pre-recorded before the tragic events in Paris, so you'll have to put that into some context. So we will roll the video and have Ms. Clements speak to us, and then I will invite our panelists to come forward and I will briefly introduce you uh, to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you also on behalf of High Commissioner Guterres for the opportunity to address this forum. UNHCR has long valued the excellent work of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in bringing focused attention to so many humanitarian crises around the world. Apologies that neither of us could be with you in person today. I'm in the Great Lakes of Africa on my first field mission with UNHCR in this assignment. And the High Commissioner is in Serbia reviewing our response to the refugee emergency in Europe. The global refugee crisis is getting far more international attention today than in the past, but it's by no means a new phenomenon. We are witnessing global forced displacement figures increase year after year for some time now to 60 million people in 2014, and they continue to rise. People fleeing their homes are an indicator of many broader problems, security, political, economic, social, and increasingly also environmental. But the staggering scale of today's refugee flows is primarily a reflection of the world's inability to prevent or resolve armed conflict. Hostilities have broken out or escalated in 15 places around the world in the last five years alone. Over the same period, the number of people displaced daily by violence and persecution has quadrupled and now stands at over 42,000 people the equivalent of a medium-sized town emptied out every single day. And not only are conflicts spreading, but they are also becoming more complex and interconnected, with a proliferation of actors, weapons, and impunity. Many of today's wars are fought by a mix of regular armies, international forces, ethnic, political, or religious militias, terrorist groups, and criminal gangs. Refugees, internally displaced persons, and the communities hosting them are often caught in the middle. A lack of respect for humanitarian principles makes access to them increasingly difficult, with often deadly results for both people in need and those trying to help. Since the beginning of this century, just 15 years ago, more than 2,500 humanitarian workers have been killed or injured in violent attacks. That's one every other day. In some places, our national colleagues' lives are at risk for the simple reason of working in the UN. The conflicts in Syria and Iraq have long become interlinked and have displaced some 15 million people across the region. That's roughly equivalent to the combined populations of Washington, Maryland, and Virginia. In both countries, Syria and Iraq, we try to provide millions of internally displaced persons with humanitarian relief despite enormous risks. You'll be discussing operational environment in Syria and Iraq in more detail later on, but let me just say one thing. We as humanitarians cannot overstate the essential importance of respecting the principles of neutrality and impartiality and of preserving the autonomy of humanitarian action. 
We have to do everything we can to help people in need wherever they are, but we cannot properly assist anyone if we are not able to talk to everyone, including the parties to the conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening in Europe today is in many ways directly linked to the events I have just spoken about. Refugees make up the vast majority of the over 800,000 people who have arrived in Europe by boat in 2015, which is a big change from just a couple of years ago when the route across the Mediterranean was primarily used by economic migrants. Syrians are by far the biggest nationality arriving today, and the growing number of people coming straight from Aleppo, Homs, and Damascus shows how little faith they have left that the fighting will stop soon. I think we all cling to the hope that a political solution can still be found and that those with influence over the many parties to this conflict can come around the same table in Vienna or elsewhere and agree to end the violence. The second reason for flight we are hearing over and over again from Syrian refugees arriving in Europe is that they are simply desperate. They are without means to continue to survive in neighboring countries. 70 to 80 percent of them are living below the poverty line in Lebanon and Jordan. And what's hardest to accept is that half of all refugee children in the neighboring countries are not getting any education. To make things worse, humanitarian agencies have faced a dramatic funding shortfall this year with refugee programs less than 50 percent funded, which has meant painful cuts in food assistance and cash support to vulnerable families. And the fact that even the most visible refugee crisis is so severely underfunded illustrates a much wider problem affecting the whole humanitarian system. Now, how do we respond to the refugee crisis in Europe? European Union member states have struggled enormously to find a common way forward, but it is clear that the only way to manage the arrival of thousands of people every day is through a comprehensive regional approach that is based on solidarity and responsibility sharing. With winter already underway in many parts of the region, more delays in a robust European response will cost more lives. When we talk about large refugee movements, we are often asked about security threats. There are many important safeguards in asylum and refugee resettlement procedures at the national level and also in the Refugee Convention. And few people are as extensively screened and scrutinized as refugees waiting to be resettled but I think it's an important point to underline in this discussion is one that many people tend to forget. Refugees are, first and foremost, victims of insecurity rather than its cause. It is by helping and welcoming them, not fearing them, that we will build safer and eventually more prosperous societies. Let me conclude with a few words on the U.S. role in this historic crisis. All our nations and communities are becoming multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and multicultural societies, something that is not only inevitable, but also a good thing, as the experience of the United States shows perhaps better than any other country. Building and maintaining tolerant and open communities is a slow and delicate process, which requires significant investments from governments and civil society alike. But diversity enriches us, and its benefit far outweighs the costs of these investments. America's engagement in the resolution of conflict is essential. The U.S. is the international community's largest resettlement country and the top bilateral donor of humanitarian aid worldwide. Its leadership in international protection worldwide is a model now replicated by others, and one on which we greatly depend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Unfortunately, we can't have a Q&A session with Kelly, but uh, we appreciate those comments. I'd like to welcome our panelists, please, to, uh, to come forward. I think uh, Kelly Clements gave us uh, particularly her last few remarks, a challenge to this panel to remain and retain the essence of diversity uh, and to welcome migrants in an atmosphere which is growing increasingly skeptical, if not uh, increasingly hostile, hostile to that uh, welcoming environment. So as I mentioned, we have an extraordinary lineup of panelists to help us understand the security, the economic, and the political implications of this extraordinary uh, migration crisis uh, in Europe. Let me begin uh, by welcoming 
Catherine Wiesner with us, the Deputy Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the U.S. State Department. Uh, Catherine has been extremely generous to CSIS. We had you here just a few weeks ago to help us understand these issues, and, and you've been very generous. We know how busy you are these days. Um, Catherine uh, uh, has served in this position since February of, of 2012. Prior to this, she was the Principal Director uh, of, uh, to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs at the Pentagon from 2009 to 2012, and she is also a practitioner. She has worked as a, a, a consultant and an aid worker in post-conflict programming and peace processes. She's served uh, and worked uh, for UNICEF in Sudan and Uganda and Darfur, and we are delighted to have Catherine here uh, with us, and we've asked her to lead off. After Catherine finishes her remarks, we're going to turn to Dr. Philip Ackerman, uh, who is the Deputy Chief of Mission here uh, at the German uh, Embassy here in Washington. Uh, Dr. Ackerman has, uh, before arriving here in Washington, he served as the Deputy Special Representative and Head of the Task Force for Afghanistan and Pakistan in Berlin. He has uh, served in the German Embassy in Morocco, as well as the Permanent Mission uh, of Germany to the United Nations. Uh, in New York. He has also uh, been at the elbow of uh, two uh, German foreign ministers in the private office of both Foreign Minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier um, uh, as, as well as a previous minister. So we are delighted. Of course, Germany has played an essential role uh, in this crisis, and we're delighted to have Dr. Ackermann join us. After uh, he concludes his remarks, we're going to keep going down the line, and we're going to hear from Eric Schwartz, professor and dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Eric uh, has previously served as Assistant Secretary of State for Populations, Refugees, and Migration so he is quite familiar with the uh, PRM and the role of the State Department in similar crises. Prior to this position, he has served at various uh, United Nations positions, including the UN Secretary General's Deputy Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery and the Chief of, of the Executive Office for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. So someone who's also been an advocate for uh, uh, encouraging the United States to accept more refugees. And finally, we're delighted to have Jeff Dyer with us, a correspondent here in the Washington Bureau of the Financial Times. Uh, it's always great to get a journalistic perspective as we watch these sweeping events unfold. Jeff has spent over a decade in China, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. We all enjoy his reporting uh, and look forward to his perspective uh, from a, such a seasoned journalist. So after our panelists are done with their remarks, we'll. I'll throw a question or two out to get the ball rolling, and then we have such an incredible audience, we're going to let you into this conversation, and we look forward to uh, taking your questions. So with that, let me get out of the way and welcome our panelists. Catherine, thank you so much for starting. Thank you, Heather, and I'm really honored to be here with um, this distinguished panel. It was also fun to see Kelly, who until a few months ago um, had her office right next to mine at the State Department. So. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to be part of this discussion, um, one of many on this topic, certainly in Europe, in the Middle East, in the Balkans, in Africa, and here in Washington. Uh, it feels like few issues have become uh, such a global concern seemingly overnight and really captured the public attention. I, I have a two and a half year old and every time I put him on my shoulders to when he gets tired of walking, I, I think of those families walking across Europe and it's not when my back starts to hurt after three minutes, you know, and it's it's not the first time those people have carried their children to safety, and they're not the only people in the world right now carrying their children to safety, but there's something about it being on the front page that just kind of sears in your mind, and um, I know many of us can't stop thinking about our own families when we see those images. Um, at the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the State Department, we have been observing migration trends across the Mediterranean, however, for some time now. Um, together with our counterparts in the EU. Um, last June, I traveled to the town of Agadez in Niger, uh, which is a town that an estimated 60% of the migrants crossing um, from Libya travel through at some point in time. Um, the, the breakdown in law, of law and order there in Libya was sort of the original uh, center of the storm. And um, as that happened and, and smugglers started to expand their operations, uh, mainly to Italy, the numbers really began to rise in 2013. 
Um, and that population was a mix of migrants from Sub-Saharan Africa, from the Middle East, including Syrians for some time, as well as Asia. Um, from our perspective then and now, the most important issue is saving lives, making sure that migrants are informed of the dangers of the journey, and building the capacity of migration management systems in all countries of transit. Uh, at the time when we really started paying attention in 2013, the focus was on disrupting the entrenched smuggling operations out of Libya and increasing the patrols at sea. Uh, in May, when the European Union came out with their comprehensive agenda on migration, we supported that comprehensive approach publicly. Uh, I think what we've seen is that the, the phenomenon, the pace of events, have just uh, outpaced. <laughs> Um, all of the efforts to keep up in terms of policy making, but I'm sure my colleague from the German embassy will, will talk about that. The um, European governments have been, you know, every week meeting to, to uh, come up with the latest set of agreements and policy proposals. Today, of course, we have a different situation, an additional dramatic situation to that migration from Libya, and uh, that's the number of refugees and asylum seekers who are traveling through the eastern Mediterranean and Balkan routes. Uh, we saw the slides earlier. UNHCR reported this morning 810,000 people have arrived by sea to Europe this year. Um, as you've also heard, more than half of this number represents Syrians, and most are arriving no longer to Italy but to Greece via the eastern Mediterranean. Um, the series of EU decisions that I'm sure we'll talk about um, as we go on include in calls for increased humanitarian assistance in countries of first asylum, uh, establishment of hotspots to register new arrivals, relocation of 160,000 migrants and refugees from Greece and Italy, a commitment to bolster the returns of economic migrants, and strengthening the management of EU's external borders. Well, how did we get here? There are many theories about how this movement has snowballed to such great effect. Um, one thing is clear, it's a complex set of factors. When the unrest in Syria spiraled into a regional crisis, uh, as Kelly was saying, Syrian refugees in Jordan, Turkey, and Lebanon started to lose hope of ever returning to their homes, uh, worried about the reliability of assistance programs. But I think really most importantly what we hear is that it's the, it's the indignity of not being able to work and support your family and not having your kids in school uh, that, has, that started to cause people to make this choice. Um, at the same time, while the group of Syrians comprises the largest part of the recent movements, there are, we have to remember, there are also many, many people from other places, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Eritrea, Somalia, Pakistan, also Nigeria, Gambia, Bangladesh. It's a long list of countries. Uh, somebody said to me recently, it's like the Syrians broke the gate, broke the fence, and now everybody's seen an opportunity to move through. Um, Still, when you look at those list of countries uh, and, and consider the circumstances there, UNHCR has said that approximately 87% of all those who arrive at sea to Europe now are coming from refugee-producing countries. So whether or not they are able to make an individual claim for refugee status, they're coming from, from difficult places. And, and the other thing I think that's really important to note is that even with, with all of these push factors, there are also pull factors. Uh, as more and more refugees and migrants arrive in Europe, then uh, there are more and more family members uh, who provide, if you will, a sort of anchor um, and are able to send money and information and guidance to others who would like to join them. Uh, we are encouraged by the series of discussions that have been concluded recently by the European Commission and European leaders, which, as I said, stress a comprehensive solution. Um, but as a, as a government um, amidst as we all have these uh, sovereign right and desire to control and manage our borders, uh, we as the, sort of the humanitarian part of the government would always stress the need uh, to remember that so many of these people are fleeing conflict and that you know, the distinction between a refugee and a migrant is one which we can talk about and does have a legal basis, but nevertheless is not, as I said I think here last time, the distinction between a deserving and an undeserving person, that all people, all migrants who are in search of a better life should be treated humanely and with dignity. Uh, we continue to applaud the generosity and the compassion with which so many uh, in Europe have uh, met and welcomed those fleeing, and I think we all have seen those amazing images and stories. So just a couple words about the U.S. role specifically. Um, 
basically, in our bureau, uh, we see our role as twofold. One, to support humanitarian assistance efforts with humanitarian funding, and secondly, uh, diplomatic engagement, humanitarian diplomacy. Um, this is a little bit different when you're dealing with a partner uh, with allies like your like Europe, European governments. Um, so there is a bit of both of that involved, but I think uh, it's a much more sort of partnership of equals in terms of exchanging best practices um, and ideas. The U.S. has provided four and a half billion dollars in humanitarian assistance since the start of the conflict in Syria. That's to internally 7.6 million internally displaced people in Syria and over 4 million refugees in the region. And as, uh, as Kelly also said, remain the top donor to humanitarian crises around the world. In 2015, we did provide 26.6 million directly to UNHCR for its programs in Europe, which will be used to provide basic assistance to refugees as they transit Greece, Macedonia, and Serbia, among other countries. Uh, and UNHCR has just come out with another appeal to deal with the challenges of the winter, which we are looking at right now. Um, given the extraordinary nature of the crisis, there's also been some support from our Department of Defense, some one-off grants of uh, funding or excess property in countries like Serbia, Croatia, and Macedonia, and some of the Department of Defense's humanitarian funds that had been allocated for the Ebola crisis have been repurposed to buy winter supplies for refugees in the region around Syria. Um, I spoke about the, uh, the kind of relationship between the United States and the European Union on these issues. We do have something called the Platform for Cooperation on Migration and Refugees. This was established in 2010. And it's basically a, a, an opportunity to exchange learning ideas, exchange visits. And some of the topics that have been discussed of late include um, resettlement and integration, border management, counter smuggling, the return of economic migrants, private sector engagement, winterization efforts and gaps, and how to coordinate our messaging and our diplomatic engagement, particularly around this issue of education and livelihoods in the frontline states bordering Syria. Finally, a word on resettlement, which we can certainly talk more about in the discussion session. Uh, resettlement of refugees globally is not a large part of the solution, but it's a very important one. Obviously, the tragic events in Paris of last week um, have sent shockwaves through the resettlement community. When you have governors coming out over the weekend and saying that uh, they're not prepared to accept any more Syrian refugees in their state until they're comfortable with the security pr procedures, it's, it's sort of your worst nightmare for those who run the program. Um, there was a statement that came out of the White House yesterday that was very clear, saying that, you know, we as Americans of today are the refugees of yesterday, and that as a government, we are entirely committed to protecting the American public from terrorism, but also entirely committed to providing refuge to some of the world's most vulnerable people. And I think it's very important that, um, you know, our political landscape is all over the spectrum on this, but um, what we have consistently uh, said and believe is that we can uh, protect the security of the United States and also provide that refuge. We have an extensive security screening process that we can talk a little bit more about. Um, in closing, uh, I think what I would just like to say about Europe's migration crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis, the spillover challenges, it's evoked global interest um, and it's very much this administration's view that it also demands a global response. President Obama has said that all nations in positions of responsibility, nations with power and capacity and opportunity, all have an obligation to come together to address these challenges. And the United States will continue to show that leadership in supporting efforts to have a truly global response to what is a truly global crisis. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much, and I look forward to our dialogue. Philip, the um, Chancellor Angela Merkel and the German government have been at the center of this crisis, and we saw the EU summit just this past week in Valletta trying to resolve some of these challenges. We welcome your thoughts. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, first of all, for having me today. Um, I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points, but, but I, I think I should start by saying that Germany is still under shock. Um, and distress um, uh, concerning the, the, the attacks in Paris. I think uh, you might be aware that Germany and France are kind of best buddies in a diplomatic world. There are perhaps no countries, no other two countries with closer ties and um, 
the, the Chancellor herself had made a very, very emotional, for her son, that's extremely emotional stun, um, uh, statement saying that we cry with you and we'll fight with you. Um, in Paris, the very evening, there was a German-French soccer match, and um, I think the, the absolute nightmare would have been if the three suicide attackers could have entered the stadium, which thankfully they could not. Um, that would have been the, the biggest uh, damage uh, in human lives. Um, so, so I think Paris is still very much on our mind, and we are very um, um, still struggling with it and trying to to, um, to find out what to do with it. Now, uh, my, my first point would be, uh, let me just give you um, a couple of um, information on, on where we stand in Germany. We, we expect this year 800,000, some say a million refugees coming into Germany. That would be the equivalent of about 3.5 to 5 million Mexicans, let's say, crossing the border in six or seven months to the United States in a country, obviously, which is um, much smaller and has, mu has much less space than the United States. It's a huge challenge, and it is an, an extremely um, difficult uh, task to cope with. Um, I think what we can say now is that um, our administration, being um, uh, known for very solid but also very slow, um, is somehow overwhelmed by this. And if it wasn't about civil society stepping up and, 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 and taking over tasks, um, this um, task, uh, well, this challenge would not have been possible or made uh, to cope with so far. So I think what we see is a remarkable um, engagement of, 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 of Germans um, outside the government. Um, I hear that 40 to 50 percent of Germans somehow are involved um, in you know, helping out, giving money or even things in kind in order to support the refugees. Um, at the same time, um, there is a growing uneasiness in Germany and, and um, Paris, and I'll, I'll come to that, is certainly um, uh, one reason and, and, and strengthens or reinforces this, this uneasiness. Um, um, I think um, we are overstretched uh, right now and um, we have to find ways and means to um, to reduce the, the flow of migrants. Now, this last two days, I read this morning, we had a little less than 6,000 a day. 6,000 a day um, is, is, is numbers going down, I would say. You know, we had eight to 10,000 a day before, but it's still 6,000 a day. It's, it's still a small city, so to speak, coming every day. So that's something where we feel that we have to think on how to, to try to, to reduce the, 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 the flow of migrants. Um, um, Europe has been mentioned, um, not an easy uh, union right now, I would say. Um, uh, the, the, the distribution of refugees in Europe, inside Europe, is very unequally um, done. I think you should mention not only Germany, we have the biggest bulk, but Sweden and Austria per capita take more than Germany, took more than Germany. Italy is a country you should mention also. Um, on the other hand, there are other countries that take less uh, or not enough refugees in our minds, and we have been struggling um, to find common ground. You, you mentioned a couple of measures uh, the European Union has um, agreed upon and, and, and will do, um, but you know, 160,000 refugees is not that much if you have uh, such, a, um, such a huge flow of coming, <coughs> of coming of refugees. Um, um, so I think that um, it, it's extremely difficult to find a, a European solution, which is, we know that it's difficult to find European solutions. If you have 28 countries around the table, it's not never easy. But in, in this case, it, it's, it turns out to be particularly different, difficult, and I think Paris will also um, change the perception. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, um, I think, and this is my th uh, second point, one should very clearly differentiate between the refugee crisis and terrorism. Uh, um, um, I just want to flag that um, um, all we know about Paris attacks, um, uh, there were not refugees but French people or, or, or North African nationals living in France. Uh, France is not a country which takes a lot of refugees. Um, 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 so I think that, um, and I, I think the Deputy Commissioner said that very clearly, the overwhelming majority of refugees flee exactly what happened in France. I mean, they want to escape terrorism and war. So um, I think this is a very, very important um, statement, um, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, at the same time, Paris will, um, in a an, in an generally very unwelcoming environment in very many parts of Europe, 
will change the perception um, and, and will, will make it even more difficult for very many countries to, to agree to, to be more welcoming to refugees. So um, I think in the, in the next months, we'll, or weeks and months, we'll see um, great reluctance and, and, and um, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, caution and, and reservations about taking more refugees because of Paris. Um, and that will influence policy making very clearly. Um, let me end by saying, you know, how, what, what, what is really the, the, the most promising, um, the most promising measures or, uh, we, we should we should take. Um, I, I would say that the Vienna meeting in, in, in on Saturday gives at least a glimmer of hope. Uh, um, I think it's quite remarkable what, what Secretary Kerry achieved in getting people around the table and 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 agreeing on a roadmap, so to speak, to to bring peace to Syria or to bring a working government to Syria. Um, this will not happen overnight, everybody knows it, but I think um, the, most, um, the most important thing is to fight the root causes for this migration uh, phenomenon, because it's a worldwide phenomenon, it's not only Syria, it's, it covers the whole world basically. And um, when you ask these Syrian refugees in Germany uh, whether they'd like to go back when their country or if their country works again, you'd find 90% would say yes, we want to go back. Uh, it's, um, you know, Germany has the experience in, in the Second World War, it's very difficult to leave home. Uh, leaving home uh, for good or, you know, with your kids, as, as you say, you know, walking, walking with kids and pregnant wives and old parents through the Balkans is, is an act of despair somehow. Um, and I think um, if, we, if we succeed in getting the root causes um, right, uh, or eliminating the root causes rather, then we might have a chance to, um, to in reverse the flow. At the same time, we in Germany are you know, very much prepared to um, um, uh, take on a, a large group of new uh, citizens or fellow citizens who will stay in Germany for a long time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you also for highlighting the role of civil society, something I think we'll want to come back to. Eric, we'd welcome your thoughts. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here, and it's a pleasure. Um, <coughs> the, the title of our session today is The Geopolitical Implications of the Migration Crisis in Europe. Uh, but to my mind, uh, the question at hand, of course, is a much broader one. Uh, as this migration crisis is part of a broader set of phenomena that is impacting the order of the world. And um, the attacks in, in Paris are a manifestation of that. They have to inform our thinking. But I don't think they fundamentally change uh, the realities um, that I'm going to be talking about uh, in remarks, frankly, that were drafted prior uh, to the events of Friday night. Uh, in short, um, we have to recognize that we are confronting humanitarian and related challenges of, of uh, significant, if not historic, proportions at a critical moment in world history, a time that compels our elected and our appointed officials in our institutions of government uh, to exercise leadership by thinking and acting uh, boldly. Uh, and the signs of humanitarian challenges of historical proportion are, are clear and compelling, and you've heard some of them. As of the end of last year, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres, estimated that there were some 60 million people displaced worldwide, and of course, um, in the case of Syria, the numbers are striking. Some half of the population displaced, with more than seven million internally displaced persons and more than four million refugees in neighboring country, countries. Uh, now, as I, as I mentioned, as significant as are these challenges, their significance is compounded by the fact that they are taking place at a transition period, a critical moment in history where there are many signs of a more chaotic and uncertain international environment. Uh, reflected in some measure by the grotesque attacks against civilians in Paris on Friday, but also reflected every day in conflict and egregious 
abuses in parts of Iraq, in Syria, and elsewhere around the world. And these challenges are accompanied, they're accompanied by an ongoing shift toward an increasingly multipolar world, which will test the capacity of the United States of America or any other power to influence events that impact the well-being of the United States and the rest of the world. Or as, just to take one example in a report from which you could draw many examples, uh, the National Intelligence Council in their Global Trends 2030 report put it, and I quote, in 15 years, Asia will have surpassed North America and Europe combined in terms of global power based upon GDP, population size, military spending, and technological investment as a reflection of the fact that we are moving, if I can borrow a phrase from a colleague of mine at the University of Minnesota, John Bryson, to what appears to be a no one in charge world. Um, and it's precisely these developments, and perhaps ironically, it's precisely these developments that underscore the crucial importance of the exercise of skillful and determined and dexterous uh, U.S. engagement and leadership. So in light of today's topic, and within my six to seven minutes, which I always think one should stay within, so I'm going to try, what might be the key elements of, of a strategy um, to exercise leadership, at least in the broad areas, issue areas that occupy the attention of this particular panel. First, even as the United States seeks to address humanitarian suffering of extraordinary proportions, we have to recognize that humanitarian and migration crises, as others have said, in Syria or elsewhere around the world, don't have humanitarian solutions. Um, that's hard for a humanitarian to say, but it's true. And they must be addressed through all the means of statecraft, including diplomacy backed by force and in conjunction with our friends and our allies. Um, secondly, while humanitarian responses cannot resolve crises that are the result of politics, humanitarian needs now are far outstripping the resources that the world is devoting to response to refugee and humanitarian crises. Uh, I and others in a public letter some weeks ago urged that $2 billion of U.S. assistance be allocated this year by the United States additionally, which would not only help to alleviate <coughs> suffering, but relevant to my point earlier, it would also demonstrate leadership and send an important signal to other governments about their obligations to do more. Um, and connected with this recommendation, if we're talking about sis this international system, uh, I think the United States, perhaps this administration, a new administration, needs to take aim at the international architecture of humanitarian response in terms of enhanced uh, coordination, management, and effectiveness. Third, uh, the United States must demonstrate a clear commitment, it seems to me, and, and this is a particularly poignant moment, I guess, to make this point, um, but it's no less important today than it was three or four days ago, that the United States must demonstrate a clear commitment to practice at home what we preach abroad. So if we're urging our European friends and allies to implement humane policies and procedures on protection for hundreds of thousands of Syrians who have entered Europe and will continue to do so, then we must demonstrate a com commensurate commitment to provide significant and substantial resettlement opportunities uh, in the United States uh, for refugees in general and for Syrians in particular. Now, especially in light of the awful events in Paris, I, you'd have to be pretty ignorant not to appreciate the political, public policy, and public education challenges to such an approach. They are formidable. But, but, but what choice do we have? If we collectively close ourselves off, uh, we are helping to realize the objectives of ISIS and its fellow travelers. Conversely, in a world of inevitably increasing migration, we have the chance to offer a model of inclusion, 
with security for other governments around the world that are confronting the challenge of welcoming new arrivals. Now, progress, not incidentally, will also enhance our capacity to exercise the kind of leadership with our European friends and allies as well as others that is so essential to promoting progress and stability in an increasingly unstable world. Eric, thank you so much for those comments. And Jeff, you have the, the worst task of uh, having to say new things when three great uh, presentations ahead of you have addressed a lot of the challenges. But I know you, and you will do it. <laughs> Jeff, over to you. Oh, well, hello. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It's a great pleasure to be on this panel. Um, I thought I would just frame my remarks in terms of just make a few points about how this is all playing, going to play out in European politics, the impact this is going to have on Europe of the, both the refugee crisis, but particularly in the context of the Paris events. And it's always a bit dangerous to make these kind of comments in the heat of something so dramatic as what we've seen in Paris in the last few days. And so I apologize if I come across as being overly bleak, but it is... It's hard to overstate just how huge an impact this whole crisis is going to have and is having on European politics. I think the first thing to say, and it's fairly obvious, but, but it has to be said, is that the, the Paris attacks are going to start and are starting a conversation about migration. The, the two are going to be inextricably linked. The Charlie Hebdo attacks earlier this year sparked a debate about freedom of speech. What are the sorts of things that newspapers and magazines can or cannot say about Islam? In this case, the conversation is going to be about, about migration. Terrorism and migration in the public mind have now become inextricably linked. Um, so over the next few days, the, the journalists and the intelligence agencies who are, who are uh, involved in, in this particular incident, they're going to be trying to piece together, you know, did someone actually come from Syria to take part in this attack? Were there any migrants there, or were they French-born individuals? And that's going to be an incredibly important work to, 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 to nail down, to find out. And we will probably find out that all, if most if not all, of the people involved were actually French or Bel Belgian nationals already, already living in, in these countries. But I fear that even if that is the conclusion, and it's a completely copper bottom conclusion, I fear that unfortunately the die is already cast and that the debate will, will, will start to shift very much against uh, accepting more migrants from Syria, and that, 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 that the public conversation will become dominated with the idea that migration is creating a terrorism risk. That will be the short-term argument that some of the people, some of these you know, million people that Philippe was talking about that have come to Germany and, uh, and other countries in Europe, that some of these people might represent a terrorist risk. But even if you don't accept that, there will be the political argument that the people migrating today are a potential terrorism risk in the future that if you have a, a mass migration of people into, into countries, many of which have not historically had a great record in resettling or dealing with migrants from different cultures, that in a generation's time, you're going to create the conditions for the kind of resentment, the kind of stress that potentially could cause a, a terrorism problem in the future. So one way or the other, these are the arguments that I think are going to gain traction in the weeks and months in Europe. Leading on from that, I think that implies that this is going to be something of a boon for the more populist far-right parties in the, in the European political spectrum. We've already seen significant gains by some of these parties in certain countries in the last few years. Uh, just recently, the elections in, in Poland helped put in a government with, with strongly or more anti-immigrant views. You know, we've seen Hungary, Viktor Orban with the, their wall. Uh, there's elections coming up in France, the National Front poised potentially to do much better than they've done historically. Or even it could play into things like the British debate that's now having about whether to stay in the EU or not. This, this kind of event could have a very sort of toxic impact on that debate. So all across the spectrum, it's possible to see, I think, that, the, that, that, that kind of politics gaining more traction in Europe. The other thing I think to say that, that does sometimes get missed, I think, in the States is, is just the, the huge impact that this migration crisis is having on the very fabric of European institutions. I mean, we, we rightly uh, focus a lot on the humanitarian aspect of it, but it, it really is throwing sand in the works in the very ways that Europe functions. This is coming on the back of the Euro crisis where uh, the EU held together, but it was a very rocky road over the last few years, and now facing this migration crisis. So you have things like, for instance, the trains that go from Copenhagen to Malmo in Sweden, one of the most 
open and active links between two countries in Europe. There are now border controls on, on those trains, checking people's identity as they passed from Denmark into Sweden. Uh, there have been some border controls placed in places in Germany and Austria. Again, these are all small things. They're just sand in the wheels at the moment, but the potential for these to spiral and become much larger and to fundamentally change the nature of freedom of movement within the European Union are, are very real and, and could easily accelerate in the coming months. And that finally leads me to my, my last point, which is we, because the politics of this have become so complicated and so toxic, we even have to start thinking that maybe we are looking at the end of the Angela Merkel era. Uh, Angela Merkel has been the, you know, the towering force in Europe, not just in the Euro crisis, but in the migration crisis, and has given political voice to the humanitarian instinct that we, that we heard about so, so finally from our other speakers here today. Um, and six months ago, it would have seemed crazy to predicting the end of her political career. It seemed like she was just, you know, would easily walk in for, for a fourth term. Uh, but, but things have started to change. It, you know, she's still very popular. There aren't obvious challengers. <clears throat> but you can feel the political tide starting to change against her in Germany because of this, because of this crisis. <clears throat> now, there is a, a glass half full way of looking at it. I mean, maybe, as Philip said, the numbers of migrants will start to slow. It's getting into winter, and so maybe the incentives aren't so good for people to come. The EU does have this plan to give a lot more money to Turkey to improve the conditions for the, the two million people in refugee camps in Turkey, to give them more incentives not to try and come to Europe. You could see a number of ways in which, and as Philip mentioned, the Vienna diplomatic process is maybe starting to gain traction, maybe starting to open up the way that over the course of months could start to see a way for the... the <clears throat> the powers, outside powers to forge a solution for the war. So maybe you could see a way in which over the next few months some of the sting comes out of the migration crisis. And if that happens, then Angela Merkel maybe is able to stand up in six months' time and say, <clears throat> I was right, I was the decisive leader who was able to look this problem in the eye uh, and show generosity of spirit, and, and we've managed to cope with it. But if it doesn't, if the, the flows still keep coming in, the pressures are going to grow spectacularly within her coalition from senior leaders in her party, and she is going to start to look more vulnerable. And if Angela Merkel starts to look more vulnerable because of the migration crisis, then we really are going to be entering into a very different political era in Europe, the way we think and talk and act about these problems. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. I apologize if those sound overly bleak uh, comments, but um, it's... What may sound bleak to you is very provocative and thought-provoking to me and a great way to lead off our conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I think all your presentations really touched on very different aspects of the crisis and speak to the complexity. In fact, in some ways, Eric and Jeff, your, your presentations juxtapose the leadership of what we should do, the leadership in the toxic environment in which it exists, and the challenges that they're there. I'd, I'd like to ask our panelists, get the, uh, get the ball rolling here a little bit, on the security dimension. Um, because, and, and, and Catherine, there has been criticism of the U.S. position not being able to receive more uh, Syrian or other refugees because our vetting process is, is so extensive, 12 to 18 months potentially of vetting, yet even today two state governors are saying we're, we're st or we want to stop that process. So I, I would love your reflections on that. And, and then for our other panelists, really, on the security, and again, Jeff, I think you're absolutely right. As the, the story unfolds of how these attacks occurred Friday night in Paris, will tell us a little bit. But there is a clear security concern in Europe. Is Schengen dead in Europe? We really now, if uh, President Hollande does what I believe will receive approval for a three-month extension of a state of emergency, which is effect closing borders, you have already internal border checks. These were always meant for short term, is this going to grow into a long term? And in fact, even uh, the CSU leader, uh, Seehofer, has suggested that we need, you know, Germany needs to deploy troops to help uh, control, manage, and ultimately screen uh, those who are coming in. So I would love the panelists' reflections on the security element, the foreign fighter element as it proceeds. And then something uh, that the panelists didn't touch on, but welcome your thoughts, on the economic impact of this. I think in many ways Europe is addressing this crisis at, like a natural disaster. That it, you know, that, that humanitarian impulse the, and the wonderful civil society response. But this is such a long-term generational challenge. The economic costs of education, healthcare, housing, job training, integration, 
uh, of, of the numbers that Philip was telling us about, it overwhelms even uh, a system in Germany that's, that's low unemployment and, and probably the best economically uh, poised to, to welcome these refugees. Speak to the economic impact of, of, the, of this migration crisis. And uh, Catherine and Eric, you both talked about the, 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 the response that the U.S. and others in, in providing UNHCR and other important humanitarian organizations with the resources they need. Uh, so in some ways, our economic response is either to help the refugees in place or we, or we to help, in some ways, finance the integration of them into our societies. Can we do both? How does that work? I think in some ways we're underestimating the extraordinary economic costs of this in the long term. So that is to give our audience a few minutes to start thinking of their questions. But why don't we just walk down the line and uh, see, I w welcome your reflections. Okay. Um, so refugees today are subject to the highest level of security screening of any traveler to the United States. So that's why we feel comfortable in saying that we have robust and intensive procedures in place. We, this involves the FBI, the Department of Defense, National uh, Center for Counterterrorism, Department of Homeland Security, a number of databases, a number of layers of security. Um, and there is in fact an extra layer for uh, Syrians, which has been added recently. Um, in fact, uh, my, my boss, Assistant Secretary Richard, who seceded Eric at PRM, came in with uh, one of her three objectives being to streamline that process. That's basically the post-9-11 world of refugee screening, um, and, and one that had, was so intensive that it had begun, become somewhat unwieldy. So a lot of the focus in the last few years had been on trying to make it more efficient, uh, upgrading it, streamlining it. Um, not any less robust, but just trying to deal with, as, as Heather said, some of the challenges of people being in the vetting process for 12, 18, 24 months. So, um, so that's what we can say. I mean, we can answer the critics and those who have fears by saying it's incredibly rigorous and, in fact, um, in the views of others, takes too long. So um, <laughs> that's our challenge, to continue to work on that within the government. Um, in terms of assisting... Um, refugees, you know, in countries of first asylum versus uh, resettlement. Um, both, of course, are absolutely critical. Uh, to be frank, you know, we have to recognize that resettlement costs a lot of money. Um, so, you know, one to three percent of the of the world's refugees benefit from third country resettlement. Um, many of these discussions around whether the United States can increase its numbers, we've gone from 70,000 last fiscal year to 85,000. This fiscal year, we'll, we're aiming for 100,000 in fiscal year 17. Um, much of that discussion is around the budget, and it's not just the budget for the Department of State, which does the um, admissions part and the first three months of federal assistance. It's the budget of the Department of Homeland Security that sends uh, officers out to do the asylum interviews all around the world. It's the budget of uh, Health and Human Services, which provides m much of the social and economic support, and then all kinds of uh, programs at the state level as well. Um, so. It's, it's expensive, and, and, and one, I, I recall a conversation that we had recently with uh, Jan Eliasson, who's the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, saying that a recent decision, I think it was OECD DAC, that money spent to um, assist with the integration of asylum seekers in Europe could count as humanitarian overseas assistance means <laughs> that it's a zero-sum game, you know, and that's, that's tough. And so you see uh, these commitments of uh, European money to Turkey, to Jordan, to Lebanon, um, you know, huge increases in the commitments there, but, but they also have to contend with, uh, as I'm sure Dr. Ackerman can speak much more to, um, the really high cost of integrating families um, and making sure that they have housing and, and uh, job training and that their kids, um, there are enough places for their kids in school. So, uh, it is hard, and so that's why you see people trying to focus more resources on countries of first asylum, but, but, but that's clearly not enough because people are voting with their feet, and when people arrive at your borders and, and seek asylum, you have to respond according to your obligations. Thanks. Um, uh, security, I think one should distinguish between um, uh, security in a terrorist, as, as a terrorist uh, context and security in a criminal or normal criminal context. And, I think, um, as I said before, overwhelmingly um, uh, we can 
be sure that the, the overwhelming majority of migrants are not terrorists and don't have bad intentions. We unfortunately don't have the privilege to vet them for 18 months. Um, they are in Munich main station. You know, I mean, what can you do? And if they are not in Munich, they are in Austria or elsewhere. So. Um, um, it is, it's all about intelligence and, and it's, it's all about uh, trying to get a grip on, on, on those who are really coming with bad intentions and we cannot include that there is a handful of those and this is, as we see in Paris, enough, you know, a handful is enough. At the same time, I repeat, um, Germany has um, about 750 foreign fighters in Syria. We have um, um, uh, Germans or, you know, people living in Germany with other nationalities fighting on, uh, with ISIS in Syria. and. Uh, we try to have an idea who that is and what they do, and I think so far we have come quite a way. Not uh, the way we not we are not where we want to be, but we we have a better image um, of, of of what's going on inside the Salafist or jihadist movement in Germany. Germany has a population of about four to five percent Muslim um, um, inhabitants. So I think we. I, I still want to say that the the, the migration flow um, does not um, really um, um, mean per se that the terrorist, the danger of terrorism, will grow exponentially or something. I would I would uh, dare to doubt that. At the same time, and this is the second thing, security is always something which has to do with day-to-day -day crime. You know, and and. And there, uh, the, the interesting phenomenon is that um, although the migration inflow is so big, crime rate is hardly growing in Germany. Huh? And that's an interesting phenomenon. People come to Germany because they, don't want, they want to start a new life and they don't want to um, really um, uh, start being, being a criminal and landing up in jail. And people are very aware of that, I think, in general. Um, what we have, and this is the big, big challenge we are coping, is trying to how to explain the guys how to, we live. Uh, and um, let me give you one example. Um, one group which is particularly dif difficult in this, in this whole context is the Afghans. We have, we have about 80,000 Afghans this year who ask for asylum in Germany. It's, I think, the second or third group after the Syrians and the Iraqis. And they are often from a very uneducated background. They are illiterate. They have no school education, unlike the Syrians, who are much more of a middle class uh, society. And you know we have stories when some Irani tells in a refugee shelter tells uh, an Afghan that he has converted to Christianity, and the Afghan says, "Now I have the right to kill you because that uh, Quran says that if you convert, it's um, it's a deadly sin, and I am going to kill you now." This is um, uh, the, the the way I think security really has an impact on on, on our daily lives. Um, I don't want to belittle the, the the terrorism danger here, but I think we should really see the proportion and the dimension of it. Now, uh, Schengen, you asked about Schengen. Schengen, I think, is one of the most palpable achievements of the European Union. And I think on the continent, at least, every European really enjoys Schengen somehow. I mean, you, you all have enjoyed Schengen. You're just traveling from one country to the other. It's um, an achievement which is not easily given up. So I think even though at some borders it is suspended right now, I don't see it gone forever or something. It, it, it might take a while, but, um, but I, I think that Schengen is, is, is where Europe becomes um, so um, graspable for everybody that I think we, we, we'd rather stick to it, um, even though suspension is an option in Schengen. Schengen can, you can suspend inside the Schengen system, and, um, and, and therefore um, um, some um, countries now, including mine, by the way, have um, introduced border controls again. Um, um, and the third factor, and that's um, the economic factor. Um, um, and, and let me just try to be a bit more optimistic in this gloomy <laughs> context here today. Um, uh, we had Dieter Zetscher, who is the CEO of, uh, CEO of Mercedes-Benz. We had him here, um, I think, three weeks ago. And when he was asked about the refugees, he said, you know, clearly, he says, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for my country. He says, this, if well done, I, I don't, uh, you know, want to deny the, the, the challenges, I suppose, but if well done, it could cause the the second economic miracle for Germany. And what Mercedes does, for example, is they go to the shelters and they try to find people, you know, we have a shortage of labor in the German market, so welders and technicians are now already employed by Mercedes. And, um, and they try to get people in training, they try to give them shelter, and they actively try to get involved in this. And, and that's perhaps a, a bit of a... Um, 
um, a positive um, uh, shimmer at, at the end of the tunnel. Um, uh, you know, almost every European country has a very bad birth rate, um, and my country is uh, amongst the worst. Um, um, uh, and, and, and we need migration. This is a fact, and, and, and we have, it's not this, this in my migration inflow we have now is certainly not the migration we, we need or we would have hoped for, but it is there, and we have to make the best of it. Um, one last word, um, just said, um, I think very uh, convincingly, um, that, 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 that uh, the Chancellor's uh, approval rates have gone down, and, and uh, I think there is an uneasiness in Germany, and people feel overwhelmed by this, and everything they see, and Paris adds to it, whether it's rational or not. Um, people are not um, happy with the government um, right now. I, s I think we have a stable government. Um, the coalition is really um, working well, but whether the Chancellor will be able to run for a first ter term will be seen next year, end of next year only. Um, we have elections in 17, and um, I think so far, um, uh, don't get nervous, uh, Germany has a stable government. <laughs> Uh, Heather, by my count, you asked 17 questions. Which, which of those 17 would you like me to answer? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to make three points. Uh, first, um, in, uh, in, in, if I can comment on Jeff's uh, reasonably pessimistic outlook. I mean, look, uh, you know, if life was easy, you know, it wouldn't be hard to uh, achieve uh, public office. Uh, I mean, it, it is in tough times. It is in challenging political circumstances where we need enlightened leadership, where we need the capacity to look beyond this crisis and recognize that if we react exactly as our adversaries would have us act, then we are acting foolishly, right? And, and, and it's, that's hard, it's a hard message to communicate. It's a hard message um, to, to have received. But if we don't make the effort, if our political leadership don't make the effort to communicate those messages, then I think we are in for a more troubled uh, international system and more trouble for Americans and for the rest of the world. So yeah, it's not easy. But if it's the thing that are, if it is if the kinds of actions that our leaders must take, then they have to step up to the plate and do it. Two other points. Um, assistance versus resettlement. Um, yeah, uh, with, uh, with 20 million refugees in the world, uh, the vast majority are not going to be resettled. Um, there are three uh, conventional under, uh, solutions for refugee plight. Um, there is return, and that does take place. Uh, and in, in Africa has, is, has a lot of, of um, returned refugee populations, uh, for example. Uh, there is local integration in countries um, to which refugees have fled. That's difficult, but it, it, it does happen. Um, and, and then there is third country resettlement. And I think there is a broad understanding that third country resettlement will be a solution for only a very small percentage of the world's refugees. But it's part of a strategy for those who are experiencing particular vulnerability, for those who have been in protracted situations for many, many years, and for other special circumstances. It's part of a, 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 of a strategy. So why do we do it? Uh, if the number, uh, we do it as a responsible exercise of burden sharing. If we don't want to play that role, then you know, that is one of the characteristics of leadership on these issues. And leadership comes with benefits, um, and which the United States has, um, you know, has um, experienced for decades, and 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 um, and and it, and, it, and this burden sharing dimension becomes more important in light of the fact that that the resettlement, the third country resettlement option in Europe is not the result of a of a, a process where governments are saying we're going to identify these communities in in countries of refuge and bring them in. It's the European governments are dealing with this as people come across the border. So that burden sharing element becomes critically important. Now the last comment I want to make is on the economic burden because I don't want to trivialize that issue. Um, but I do want to trivialize that issue. Um, because um, there is such an irony in this discussion. There is such an irony in this discussion. The United States of America, the world's most powerful economy. We are where we are 
in, a law, in large measure as a result of policies and practices that have encouraged the movement of people into our country and has have encouraged the, 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 the realization of a country of immigrants. We are spared, we have been spared of the economic, social challenges that are confronting many of our European friends and allies, Japan, um, in terms of the revitalization of our society, the, 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 the sustaining of the engine of economic growth. Immigration, uh, including the welcoming of refugees, has resulted in such significant um, economic existential benefits for our society that there is something there's something upside down about this discussion. And I think, you know, and, and if, if I had much more time, we could talk about statistics that really, I think, make this case of, uh, yeah, there, there are gonna be financial, budgetary costs, and we're not spending enough, especially our Department of Health and Human Services, in terms of that transition period. But in the grand scheme of thing, things, those numbers um, if not trivial, they are modest in comparison to the economic benefits that result for our society. Thanks, Eric. Jeff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just make a couple of quick points. The, the first one is that from the, if it, like the, the security terrorism risks from migration, it seems to me that the Europe and the U.S. are facing fundamentally different situations. Europe is being overwhelmed by hundreds of thousands of people coming from places like Syria who is having to vet on the spot. There's no way for the authorities there to, to be able to keep an eye on everyone who they think might be suspect. So while there is no evidence yet that, my, that any of the terrorist acts have been committed by migrants, it's entirely legitimate in Europe to ask questions about whether or not people you know, from ISIS are trying to use these migration flows to sneak into Europe. To get, for a Syrian migrant to get into the US, the, the, system, the, the, the process they have to go through is so rigorous. I don't want to say it could never happen, but it seems to me a little bit unlikely that if you're an ISIS militant in Raqqa and you wanted to do something in the US, that you would go through a process whereby you get interviewed by the FBI, you get all your biometric data taken, you go you put through half a dozen databases by the intelligence community and the DOD. It's possible that could happen, but it seems to be relatively unlikely that that's the route you would go down if you thought that you were trying to get into the U.S. So I think that the, the risks that Europe and the U.S. are facing from this are, are very, very different. The second point, just on the, on the, uh, on the economics, and really just to echo what, 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 what Philip said, sure there are big upfront costs, of educating and housing and, and social benefits, but if you're a demographer and you're looking at this from, from a demographic point of view, this is, you know, everything that Europe needs is in some ways what, it, what is happening. I mean, you know, they have de de declining populations, big pension burdens coming down the road. Uh, everything that a lot of European countries needs would be something like a bunch of educated Syrians who desperately want to improve their lives, who have skills, uh, maybe start businesses, who want to do everything they can to improve the prospects for their children. That's precisely the injection of energy and people and dynamism that a lot of European countries need. So if you were able to completely take out the politics and the terrorism issues, there is absolutely a, a very optimistic and positive thing that could come from this if you were able to detract from all those other security, political, humanitarian issues. Wonderful. We have about five minutes, so let's bundle a few questions. Oh, I see some energetic hands here. So let me just, uh, we'll take the three here, and then I see three over there. So Caius, we'll go right there. If you could please introduce yourself, your affiliation, and please keep these questions short so we can get our panelists to respond. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you to the panelists. Um, my name is Barbara Mader. I'm a writer, and I just wanted to applaud Eric for what he said, because I think he is spot on with everything. Yesterday, I was in a service there was a joint religious service with a Protestant minister, a Muslim imam, and a Jewish rabbi, and the word xenophobia came up so often, which is often not spoken in any type of a religious service. And now we have two, two prominent political candidates saying, no, we don't want refugees, and one of them is the son of a Cuban boat person, and the other one says, only if they're Christian. And I know none of you are political scientists, but this is the political part of some of this, and I'd like someone to address that, please. 
Uh, good morning. My name is Rachel Hazlett. I'm with the National Intelligence Council, and thank you all for your participation. Some really enlightening uh, comments from from the entire panel. Um, Jeff, to, to your point about the role that the media is playing in all of this, I, I do have a question as to with the the politics that can be injected into this particular conversation. What role do you think the media should be playing in trying to keep the facts the facts rather than injecting um, potential fear mongering into the conversation? Thank you. Yeah, morning. Yeah, my name is Rosemary Seguera. I'm a president of an organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts and violence. Thank you for so much for your presentation. The cost roots of the, the refugees and immigrants is uh, leadership all over the world, in Africa, in Syria, in where that is the cost root of the problem. And looking at uh, what we are talking about, all those 70% of refugees don't have any IDs, the good ones and the past ones going to the country. So the ISIS, the conflicts, they are inside there. So we should look at resettlement, Tata, where we can have buildings, where we can collect Tata. Where do you come from? Well, they can only remember their names and where they come from. None of them has their IDs. So there are bad people inside those people. So resettlement is the first thing we should do. So how do we work together as I'm from Africa. The Africans are also to Belgium, with France, everywhere, also running from their countries, the same problem everywhere. So how do we work with the social so civil society, government, and you guys to make this? Otherwise, we'll be talking today, tomorrow, another conference, and another, and another. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have three questions over here. Kaius, you're going to have to watch the cord there. And then we're going to have to let our panelists go, so you guys can take a break and go to the next one. Yes, sir. Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lukas Lanzer, and I'm representing the Swiss Embassy. And I would like to know from Dr. Ackerman, um, the EU is intending to distribute the refugees among the EU countries. Uh, Germany, as far as I heard, is in favor of this solution. Um, how do you want to make sure that once the refugees are distributed to all the other EU countries, they don't come back to Germany or Sweden uh, without uh, Introducing new internal borders within the Schengen system. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I great. think we saw two. Yeah, it's the one back there. Okay, thank you. And then we have one in the back, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, Rachel Oswald, Congressional Quarterly. Um, returning to uh, the earlier question and expanding a little bit, how does the Republican presidential race um, inflict um, uh, heightened politi politicalization to the question of refugee resettlement, and how are you seeing that, or do you predict that polarizing the American public against resettlement? One way in the back, Caius, right there. <laughs> yes. Oh, great. Thank you, Donatella. Hello, I'm uh, Christian Brunmeier. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Austrian Embassy in Washington. Um, the figures uh, are really um, great. I mean, we have, uh, we have had a, a, a over the last 10 weeks uh, 450,000 refugees crossing Austria. Um, many of them, of course, continued to Germany, but of course, the, uh, many also want to stay in Austria as they see the way uh, more more difficult, so we are counting with 85,000 uh, applications for asylum in Austria this year. So it's uh, the, the numbers are huge, and so an important uh, word in this context is burden sharing and solidarity. And um, um, I also have noted, uh, and I support the words of uh, Dean Eric Schwartz when he said that uh, also that the regarding the U.S. strategy that it would be important uh, to have the U.S. as an with an including policy and uh, offering opportunities for a resettlement and at the same time uh, meeting of course the security criteria so that to have this this balance so this leads me to the numbers uh, mentioned today by uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Wiesner uh, 85,000 in fiscal year uh, 2016 and uh, 100,000 uh, in the coming uh, fiscal year and now the question is um, uh, we have uh, seen the terrorist attacks in Paris. Will this number still hold? Uh, I've, uh, as I understand well, 85,000, uh, uh, the quota of 85,000 is already, um, it has been decided, but uh, the 100,000 uh, are not really formally decided. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to work the opposite way. Jeff, I'm going to have you reflect. And honestly, colleagues, I'm so sorry, Eric, you thought I asked a lot of questions. I'm going to just give everyone literally a minute to respond. And uh, thank you so much. Sorry, this is unfair. We need to keep this conversation going. If I can take the media question and the, the GOP question quickly. On the media front, uh, when something like this happens, 
the kind of the word that goes out in every news newspaper and every newsroom around the world is 80% of what you hear in the first couple of days is wrong. So be very, very, very careful because every detail in something like this is so potentially politically explosive that you have to nail down every fact before you print it. Uh, and so there's no there's no excuse for not doing that. Beyond that, clearly there are some pu publications that are, are going to run with this anti-immigrant agenda, but you also have very leading senior politicians all across Europe who've made very important comments just in the last few days. The former French president called yesterday for a new foreign policy in France. The premier of Bavaria made some very strong comments about the risks of, of, of all these migrants from Syria coming to Germany. We have to reflect those very genuine political debates as well. We can't just ignore that even while we're sifting through the facts. On the GOP front, clearly this is playing very much into the anti-immigration tenor of the debate. Uh, there's no way to, de to deny that. However, I'd just make one slight counter-argument is that if you're a GOP voter watching this, some, when something like that Paris happens, you do have to think to yourself, who would I want to be the president of the US on a day when something like this might happen in our country? Uh, so we've had a political debate so far where a lot of it's been about personality and attitude and where experience has been very much downplayed. It's entirely possible something like this will make people think, well, actually, maybe, maybe we need someone who actually knows something about what's going on and knows what they're doing and would know how to react in these situations. So it could cut both ways, I think. Um, I, I think, I guess the only point I would make uh, in light of all the questions and in light of the minute that I have um, is that, um, you know, the, the perception of a, of a series of events as a, a crisis is, um, is something that in, in some measure, it, it's certainly a function of reality, but it's also in some measure a function of perception, right? Um, because, um, and, and I think perception is very much um, affected by the skillfulness or lack thereof of, as I said before, leadership and management. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant in the European context where um, there, there hasn't, we, uh, the European governments haven't really developed a management structure uh, for um, a processing or you know, um, um, uh, um, considering the, 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 the numbers of, the, uh, of, re of refugees who are coming across the border. So I think, again, it, 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 it's a much longer conversation, but I really think political leadership and political and logistical management of, of these issues is really of, of critical importance. And because I think if publics see that governments have things pretty much under control, it creates a very different perception. I'd like to concentrate on the question of my Swiss neighbor here. Um, uh, I, I think ideally, um, the ideal solution from a German point of view would be some kind of key um, according to which refugees would be distributed in the European Union um, uh, so that you don't, you, you are not able to pick the land of your choice, but it might be that you end up in Estonia or Portugal or, or Ireland for that matter. Um, um, of course, in this context, um, we are not there yet. I mean, we are far from it, actually, <laughs> but, but that would be a, an ideal solution from our point of view. But um, the moment you don't want to be in Estonia or Portugal and you want to move elsewhere where your family is or where the economy is better, you lose entitlement. You know, I mean, the, 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 the you, refugees are dependent on what they get from, from governments um, and what they, you know, or, or civil society for that matter, but um, schools or, 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 or shelter or, or you know, stipends or uh, get money to, to uh, are coming from government. So the, the moment you, you move, this entitlement um, is, is, is gone, and, and that is a difficult discussion, I a difficult decision to, to take. So I think um, there is this danger that people move freely uh, throughout the European Union, but they know that the risk they run is that they are dependent then on family members or, or, or guys who live, or friends who live elsewhere. Um, it, it's a, it, we have to tackle this problem, but we'll come to it, because so far, actually, <laughs> we, are, we are not seeing it. Um, it's because people are reluctant to take uh, refugees. Okay. <clears throat> so some of my colleagues may get more gray hairs over it, but the refugee resettlement numbers will hold, those that have been announced, and I think you may even see them increase. It, it, it is an area where we will 
continue to show leadership. Um, the heightened politicization of the resettlement program is of great concern, and I think, you know, as we see, it just, it, some of it feels really cheap, but also shows just how easy it is to play on people's fears. So we have a job to do. We have a really important job to do to tell the story <laughs> of the security screening that's in place, to tell the facts. There are 14 Syrians who've been resettled in New Orleans so far, not 10,000, as some of the blogs that have gone viral say. That's basically two families. Um, and, and to tell the story of who, um, <laughs> who refugees are, you know, that these are families fleeing violence, fleeing war, fleeing persecution, and that whether they're Christian or not, when they move into your neighborhood and you get to know them as neighbors and people and, children and uh, families whose children go to school with yours, that um, it, it turns out that they're, they're not so scary and foreign as we think they are. They just want to come and live their lives alongside of us. Well, let me thank first uh, Kelly Clements, the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, for giving us that video presentation that was so helpful. Catherine Phillip, Eric, Jeff, fantastic presentations. Clearly, we must continue this discussion. Disinformation, information, leadership, uh, we're, this the new normal is going to be with us, and we're going to have to work with it and show leadership through it. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion.